Okay, how's everybody doing? So I have my nice little workspace here now, right? As uh, some of you may or may not know, uh, this is a whole new build. I redid the whole room, um, as you'll notice in some of the uh, earlier content, just a few episodes back. And uh, I created this workspace, uh, or I designed the layout, I should say, or the room, like the whole concept of the diorama shadow box shelf layout style. In such a way that it was quite high, like probably higher than what most people are used to, but perfect for viewing though. Like when you walk up to it, it's like you're walking right into the scene, you know, like you're on a boat, let's say, if it's a waterfront kind of thing like this, like you're at this level coming in. Like you're not looking down like from a helicopter or, you know, it's not too high either that you're under the bridge like a troll, right? Anyway, um, I really am happy with the height right now i i uh there's a few challenges though like in terms of reaching in two feet which uh, i have you know a small step ladder and platform so that's easily overcome but part of the madness or reason for my madness to do this was to create the space um you know the vertical space to work underneath you know to to utilize, a, like to make a small room that's only 10 by 12 feet as uh, efficient as I can, which not only accommodates the layout, but my workspace and, uh, and, and other people that might be in the family too, right? And that's the trick, you know, to get away with it. <laughs> So design, right? Design and uh, and it makes, you know, when you're patient like that and you design things that way, it's a real pleasure to settle into the whole deal, you know. Okay, so in, in terms of settling in, uh, most of you know that the, the barge slip approach is part of the roadbed. Like it, I have to get this built first for the most part before I go on to actually laying track, which um, seems pretty basic, but this is unique because this barge slip is in the foreground and it's a featured uh, model. So it needs to be built to a certain standard, uh, mind you, like it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you know, as long as it's a good representation, you know, that I'm happy with, uh, then I'll be content with it. And and I think it will be, right? I mean, there's a few things I've had to cheat, like dimensionally, like that, that are just not going to be perfect. Because number one, I don't have a blueprint. I'm interpreting from photos, for the most part, and a live view, and then my own napkin drawings, you know, um, that, you know, get you know, <laughs> filed in here, you know. Um, and so far, I'm pretty happy with the way the model's looking. So now uh, that the concrete, like abutments, the piles are done, the tie work in this facade of timbers is pretty much done. Although this top one is not quite as high as it should be, but I can always pack that out with 30 thou, which I'll do when I add these railings near the end, because these will just get ham-fisted or knocked off if I apply them now. So, And then like these lamp standards will get done at the very end as well. And yes, they'll be lit up. There's going to be LEDs in all of these. So it'll be really cool, which I wanted to mention to all of you because I never, I mean, some of you may have thought of that already, but if you picture this scene with the water here, which you'll see, just like, just as you see this actual photograph, I will be able to encompass with the camera. On the model just like this that's part of the goal right 
because um, there'll be this much of a foreground of water to model to fair ratio and then the trees in the background and then the warehouse in behind but can you imagine it lit up you know if i can dim the led lights which i plan to do as an option down the road so i can have just my basic leds lighting up the layout and then i'm going to switch over to a dimmable uh, lighting bank so i can dim them down and then turn on the leds to light up this whole waterfront like wouldn't that be cool anyway so in terms of the the steel work now uh, I'm going to use 30 thou plain sheet here, number 9030, okay? And then I'm going to use for the uh, girders and the webbing, if you want to call it that, or the plates in between supports and so on. I'm going to use 20 thou and then 156 by 125. So number 127 and 126 and 930 will be what I use. And then I have to also be careful, like, so this tucks in underneath the model so i got to make sure that when i add these upper and lower plates which i'll add on top of uh, this long run of 30 thou i want to make sure that it fits in this space and that it also leaves about 20 thou for these foot plates here because that's important to me that there's a gap like the steel doesn't actually sit on the concrete it actually sits on metal plates with I'm going to use some Grantline nut and bolt casting because that'll be a nice little uh, detail, you know, uh, to add in there, right? Even though I don't consider myself a rivet counter. <laughs> Jeez, that term, you know. Somehow we use that term as a, as a kind of a straw man benchmark. I don't know why, but anyway, so that's what I'm going to do, okay? And it should be really cool. And then after I do these, uh, I'm going to do this main ramp big steel work right here which will be pretty basic but i'll probably use 80 thou here because it'll need to be more rigid because it spans longer and then so yeah and then we'll probably move into these hydraulic uh corner models you know which i've already started right okay okay so this is just a little quick tip for my cutting jig um now, I realize that everybody has their own unique way on their modeling bench. Uh, your way is probably about as unique as your personality is unique and distinct from everyone else. So this is what I do. I, you know, build up these little cutting board jigs, you know, of scrap from scrap plywood. This is a piece of maple here for my backstop. And then maple rails to keep this plywood straight, which is 3 8 Baltic Birch 7 ply. So it's a nice flat, straight, square uh, cutting board, you know, for cutting all my plastic. And you can see here with the space on both ends, I can clamp with a C clamp, this straight edge. See on both ends. And then I can just, you know, slide work in and, and cut. I can use it you know, to sand against, etc. Okay. Okay, so I'll show you how I attach the top plate to the girder. You know, when I'm making girders, they're very easy to make, actually, if you set up a jig like this. Uh, so I'm going to use number 127, 20 thou by 156 thou. Okay, and then, so I just have my backstop here. So I'll just take a strip like that. What I like to do, too, is just take a stroke across each piece that I glue. You know, it just knocks the sheen off the plastic and it actually enhances the uh, adhesive quality. It, it, it just seems to really grab uh, the solvent really good. So I just lay it in here like this. 
okay all right so that it's butted up against there nice I just take my solvent and I just like don't put too much pressure on it yet but just put a light bead along there like that and then just push it up against there all right you can put your square up against there too but just be careful that if you still got a bit of pooling solvent that if you push your metal square into there it'll it'll kind of ripple it a bit make it look I mean if you want a corrosive look to the plastic that's okay but anyway that's how I do it and then you can see here that uh, I need a f longer length than what the sheet is can you see where I joined uh, the seam like it's in between here somewhere it's hard to see right you know once again, right, we use the proper adhesive, plastic solvent weld, or mech, or whatever one you like to use for the plastic, okay? So I just want to mention something quick. Notice these web pieces, these risers on the girder plate here. Notice the shortness here. They're short here. Okay. Now that's deliberate because like even when I put this bottom plate on, it's going to be a big gap there. Now for you engineer types, you might know why that is. Uh, I can only guess it has to do with water or build up or something so they don't build up around the corners here where the welds are so that it just evaporates. I don't know, maybe you know, but I can show you a photo of that. So you can see that just the mid uh, span risers here have them, like every, like these two, these, these two, these two, these two, but these three, like here's the end of the girder, and then they join here. They're about approximately 30 feet long, each of them. Um, they go all the way to the bottom, and they're bolted together and, and sit on these uh, foot plates right here, right? But why this gap is here, I don't really know, to be honest. If somebody knows, maybe they could mention in the comment below. Okay, so let's just talk uh, about this uh, approach girder then. So I got them both built. I just need to run the bottom or top plate, actually in this case bottom plate uh, on there. And what I did was, is I, you can see just these two middle ones were a bit shorter, right? There's a bit of a gap here. So, and then these ones here, the ones in the middle, like the general uh, ones on each girder, this is all one piece anyway. Um, I cut longer like a half a millimeter a millimeter longer just so when I butt them up against here that they'll overhang a bit and then what I do is I just take them like this on my cutting board here and then I'll grab like a sanding stick just to hold it like and run on this rail here and then I'll just this is sandpaper glued on again and then they just are nice and square and flush and then I can just put that other plate on top and that girder is complete there see okay and just quickly in passing remember how I talked about making these uh, sanding boards right like just take a bunch of plywood or s strips of wood if you can cut a whole bunch of these and then lay down a piece of like 180 uh, I use 220 and 180 and then just take a, an old brush with the you know just soak it in water a bit and then pour some carpenter glue 
like this all over the back of the sandpaper like or on a piece of plastic or wax paper or something and then just lay these sticks down like this on the whole span of the paper I think you can get four I guess across or whatever um, I just ran them short on here but you can cover the whole stick if you want and then leave a bit of a gap and then put some books and weight on top and then when it dries just just cut through like that the paper and then pull them off and then just clean them up right and then once you get the one side done get the other grit sandpaper and flip them over and do the same thing and make a whole bunch of these you can never have enough of them boy do they ever come in handy you know for squaring up stuff like you can even do it this way too you know really really handy okay and then for those of you that are not too sure about this this is just a piece of plywood that's uh how long is this anyway i think it's only it's 20 22 and three quarters long and then i put a piece of three quarter or maple that's a quarter inch glued that on and clamped it for a nice straight edge so i can put things against it right okay and it was just a matter of just laying it on here and making a mark just squaring it up with the square you know like the lines in this case it would have been this here and uh, yeah there you have her man and and if you leave these ends like don't cap the end of your cutting board so you can put clamps on it like that see you can clamp from here clamp here in three places and then you can clamp all the way over top onto this board too on each end okay it's just a simple jig a jig is just whatever you make that works for you okay Okay, so these girders are built up and there's some nut and bolt uh, casting work uh, that I want to do here. I have all these nut and bolts, uh, lots of them left over from Grantline back in my ON3 days. And a lot of them are appropriate for HO as well. So this one's for the rivet counter. <laughs> Actually, they're not rivets, man. They're, they're bolts, okay? Anyway, so um, these bolts here are on the underside of the top plate that hold the beam the uh, wooden beam you can sort of see them anyway these drill bits I've mentioned them before they're by God hand okay they're made in Japan like they're just unbelievable unbelievable quality anyway I don't even use a mandrel for them like they're so sharp that when you just turn with your hand and it just goes right through that's 30 thou so anyway yeah so all I'm doing with these is is I've drilled the holes marked on top so they go down through the top like that okay and then I just flood with a little bit of glue uh, just so that I have like this is the way it'll look like that okay so there's one for the bolt counters not the rivet counters <laughs> some details I don't like to admit but I'll admit that I I count the bolts now and again Here's another little essential tool right here, these little nippers. These I've, I, I picked up, oh, I don't know, almost 30 years ago now, I think. Um, they're made in Switzerland, and uh, I never use them for metal, you know, so they But they're carbide, stainless carbide, uh, fantastic. But uh, you can get them around, they're flushed flat here, you see? Anyway, they're ideal for uh, nipping plastic. That's what I use them for. Like I want to nip off all these bolts fittings right just clean them up quick and they're good for a nip and strip too if you overrun strip you know when you're building up like this all right an essential tool that should be on every modeler's bench Okay, so I wanted to show you how I'm going to build up the uh, steel girder feet that sit on the concrete slab, like in this photo here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number 128, 20 thou thickness by 188 wide, which is this strip right here. And then this here is a leftover novelty, right? Remember I use that for the tie-in spacing? 
Okay, and I cut the strip the same width as this strip, as the 128. Okay, and then let me just draw you a profile of what this looks like. Like the profile of this looks like this on the surface, goes straight down, angles up like that, goes it for a little ways down, like that and so on and then it's got the flat back like this right so it's 40 thou here so what I'm going to do is with this chisel blade is I'm just going to cut pieces here like that right okay and then I'm going to keep this piece and then they're going to be glued onto the strip like this it's this long strip and then the actual plate girder is going to sit in here like this actually it's this should be larger so here's the base like this plate let's just say is right here and then the girder goes up like that all right and then I'm going to have bolt right here like that okay so it's going to look like this. See this here? It's going to sit like that. Okay? And so what I've done is is I just take I just take these and there's a flat edge there and I just go like this. Bang bang bang. And I just cut a whole bunch of these. I'm pretty much done there, but I'll show you and then I just Take a blob of glue. I need 20, so I think I made 24 or so. And then I'll just take this and just stick it on like that. Okay. So now I got a hole. I got 25 bridge feet, pretty much ready to go. Also, also I'm going to do next is I'm going to drill two holes and put two nut and bolt castings there because that's important, right? The bridge feet. It's a nice little detail that every model bridge should have. Take a look at uh, model railroads and see how often the builder puts the bridge feet in. All right? They don't just put steel girders down on concrete like this. All right? They have plates that are bolted into the concrete and it keeps them up off the block like that. Okay. And then I can just cut these to size. Like I, if I know they go this deep, I'll cut it there and then I'll leave a little bit maybe just as an extra detail plate right there. So I can, you know, change them up a bit if I like just to add a little more interest to them. They don't have to look exactly like the prototype. That to me is rivet counting, not this. Okay, so I've got all these uh, steel girder plates done for the feet. And you can see that uh, I just drilled out and inserted the bolts in there. And then give it a soak of glue over top. And then I just nibble off the uh, stems here. And then what I'll do is I'll just paint this whole strip like a primer gray or whatever for starters and then I'll determine the, the size that I'll cut them. Like I'll give you an example right here. I cut one already and I'll show you how they'll go in here. So this girder just sits up, there's just like 20 thou space under there so it's on that 20 thou plate. So there'll be two of these on each concrete block. It'll go in like that. And that's prototypical right there. That's about as good as she gets for me anyway. So I'll have to install these after I glue the steel girders in place because once these feet are in, they actually lock the girder in place. Like it won't come out because it fits underneath. tilt that up for you for a second. Okay, so see how that rabbit that I cut in there in the plywood, remember? So it fits right underneath there and then that little 
return there on the wood will get painted black and that will just be a beam, a black beam, just like this upper beam is simulated with plastic whereas this is just the plywood and I'll just paint it out black just like the prototype Okay, rivet counting. <laughs> um, there's something I want to share that uh, I think is important for the overall community here when it comes to that term and how it's being used uh, by people, comments or channels, as a type of uh, straw man polemic in order to either benefit their channel or to cast a kind of cloud over you know, modelers that uh, are advanced in their years and in their practice and almost suggesting that there's sort of this um, dark cloud over the hobby. And, you know, there's nothing further from the truth. I mean, there's going to be obsession on every level. There's going to be people that, uh, you know, don't agree or don't like certain people for some reason because it makes them feel a certain way. But, you know, like, I'm not going to apologize for doing this type of thing because, after all, at the end of the day, it's the desired detail that I want on the model. I mean, I'm a modeler, right? And in this case, I'm a model railroader, so I'm actually modeling. Like, if you're just hogtied to just ready to run and then you want to call yourself a model railroader, then that's fine, right? But understand something, that that's not where the term originated, okay? It didn't come from like an already existing ready to run market and then people call themselves model railroaders it came from a generation and a culture that did this sort of thing they made everything right and they chose to model according to the prototype because that was what they did and that's the way it was and it still is and it's not some old archaic you know stuffy tradition you know counting the rivets so to speak or in this case nut and bolts okay so let's not like you know cast you know discrimination on you know ideas or people that choose to model whether you call them rivet counters or not because it's an important part of the hobby and they're all part of the community as well um, I don't go that far. In this case, I want to do this because A, I think the model deserves it, and B, because I actually enjoy some of it. But I'm not building a competition model here, or I'm not uh, uh, obsessing about every little tie plate and every little size of the rivet anyway. So I don't know how people define that term. But, you know, let's not use it as a sort of a, a straw man polemic as if to. Uh, benefit you know a general populace in the hobby that somehow can't be attracted any other way all right i just wanted to share that and just to close on that these just happen to be a lot of uh grant line nuts and bolts uh that i've had from uh, all my o scale days and uh they can cross over to different scales obviously as being represented as different sizes so and then these bolts here go through the bottom of these ties every seven ties and they hold the beam work there's some uh, lumber on top of that when this is right side up so that's why I'm doing that because you'll see them okay Okay, so let me explain this conversion principle from photograph to draft in another way because I respect the fact that we all learn differently. Like some of us can just do mathematics and figure things out. Some of us are very visual. And in my case, I'm a very visual person and that's how I determine size and ratio. And oftentimes I'll just uh, mark increments freehand and I'll measure them and they're all fairly accurate. It's just from just doing it a thousand times, right? And being very visual orientated or some people can just do mathematics and just I've seen them do it and then you just start marking things that, like they just think differently right so this is the principle about what I use to interpret a photograph to get the specs for a model like let's pretend that this 
little square house diagram is an actual photograph. This is the physical size of the photograph. So we want to determine, like, you know, maybe, okay, there's a window up here, you know. Um, how do I know the size of that window and the height from the ground to here? So one example can be, like, this is just a standard door. We can usually tell by a photograph, and a standard door height is 7 feet. We know that. Approximately, give or take a few, right? Approximately 7 feet. So if this is the photograph, we just take a ruler, which should have millimeters on it and standard because a millimeter has the smaller increments for this purpose. Now, I want to determine how high this wall is. I want to build a model of it from a photograph that I like. And there's a door on the photograph I'm going to use as a reference because I know most doors are seven feet. So what I do is, is I just put my ruler on there and I go, oh, look at that. This, this door is 20 millimeters. Okay. So then I go up here like this, 20 20 20 oh look it's just right on bang on like sometimes you'll have to cheat the ratio maybe it'll be 18 or 22 but in this case we're using 20 millimeter uh, increments as a rule to convert this to a model drawing or a draft so we got 20 40 60 80 and if each 20 millimeters is seven feet we have seven feet seven feet seven feet seven feet that's what 28 so it's 28 feet from the top here down to ground level right because we know that this door is our sample for a ratio so then what we do is is we just take our model railroad ho scale and we know what 28 feet is on here okay it's right there okay see that that's 28 feet. So then I can take this ruler and I can lay a standard ruler on it. There's the 0 to 28 feet, which is right here. So that's roughly 98 and a half millimeters or just under 4 inches. So now I know that when I build the model, this wall is approximately four inches high. Like, I can just build it at four. Like, who cares if it's five or six inches different, right? Now, what about this window here? Well, okay, so we have a standard by which we measure on this photograph with, which is 20 millimeters to seven feet, right? So here's another 20 millimeters. So seven plus seven is what? 14. Wow, this window is 14 feet from ground level to here. How big is this window? Okay, so 20 millimeters is approximately 7 feet. So let's just put our ruler on there. Oh, geez, it's uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 millimeters. So that's just over half of 7 feet, right? Which So m maybe this is a 4 foot by, well, there's pretty much half, 10 mil. So 3 and a half. So it's 4 feet this way and 3 and a half this way. And it's 14 feet off the ground to the bottom of the window. And that's how we know. And then we use our HO ruler for those measurements. Four feet, three and a half. And in this case, 14 would be down to here. There's 14 feet. Because this is just a photograph. It doesn't matter what size the photograph is. And it doesn't matter what increment standard you choose to sample off of a standard known size of something. And in the case of the bridge or the ramp, I know that the railings, like I used the railings to determine, because I knew that the railings were approximately 40 inches high. And I just used the same principle as this in order to get the depth of that ramp girder. That's how I did it. Whether it's 12 foot six or 11 foot six really doesn't matter to me. Okay, as long as the ratio is in balance with the overall look of the subject that you're modeling, then you'll be close enough to the prototype. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at this ramp girder and let's talk a little bit about drafting 101 from a photograph. How do I get this model size? steel girder, ramp girder in this case, from this photo. How do I get these measurements fairly accurate from this? Okay, I'll just tell you what I did to do this. 
and then I'll give you a tip, which you probably, a lot of people already know about this, but I'll share it for those that don't, because there's a lot of you that want to learn how to do this. Okay. So in this case, I can go right to Google Earth, find this actual barge slip. I can go down from a bird's eye view at any zoom level, and there's a little toolbar on the side of the Google Earth app, which is free. And I can mouse click here, and I can stretch it all the way down, mouse click there, and, and let's just say for the purposes of this video, it's 100 feet. So I know now it's 100 feet. So how do I know what 100 feet is in, in, in just regular standard measurement, let's say? Okay, so I take this here, and this ruler is 85 feet HO scale, and then I go here, and it's another 15, let's say. So that's 100 feet, and 100 feet is 15 inches. So that's how long this girder is going to be. It's going to be 15 inches. How do I know the height of this? So I can't really measure it with Google Earth. Well, I know that this railing post right here is probably going to be industry standard, which will be anywhere from uh, 38 inches to 44, give or take, right? Like most railings are three and a half to four feet high. I decided to go with uh, uh, 30, was it 38 or 40 inches, let's say. So I can take and put a ruler on that at this aspect of the photograph. Let's say this, this flange running up, that that's... Okay, I'll just say, okay, so oh, look at that. That's 20 millimeters from the top of that rail to this beam. So there's another 20 to this flange running this way. That's 40, right? 60, 80, 100. So I know this is 100 millimeters. So I just take the 100 millimeters, and I know this is 100 millimeters. I put it on there, and, I, and then I have my height. Okay, that's how I do it. The napkin drawing from the photograph... So the napkin drawing to the draft is how I get this model size. This is not scale in any way. It just tells me all the features I should know. It's just notes. This is the inside of the girder, the third middle one that you won't really see, but just this end. There's upright flanges here. Uh, this angle is sketched in some details here. Where does this support beam go that lifts the ramp up and down? Oh, it's between the two columns, make sure. So this angle has to see, it's all ratio. When you interpret from a photograph you can get reasonably accurate uh, you surprise yourself too if you go through this exercise and i know this angle is greater uh here you'll see a round sort of a rounding on the edge i only figured that out i didn't have a photograph of it because this actual ramp the whole thing pivots right it actually pivots up and down with the tide to line up with the barge so it wouldn't be square if it's tight against this concrete slab have to have room to pivot so that kind of thing right okay so now that I have this rough draft and I'm happy with it and it looks like it's in good ratio to the approach girder which is already built and these are the railings which I'm happy with this profile on top of this and on top of this which I'll do last now I can cut this out so I take a piece of 80 thou I just roughed it up with some sandpaper just so that I can pencil on it better and more easily and all I do is just simply draft this rectangle and cut out three of these, or two and a half, one for the center. And there you have your, your main plates for your side girders, right? Okay? Okay, so the girders are drafted onto the 80 thou sheet. And once again, I've clamped it down to my cutting board, right? My homemade cutting board here up against the straight edge. This here, I use the C-clamp on both ends. Uh, I recommend you do this. Like when you're handling the thicker material and you get to put a little more pressure on your scribe, I mean, you don't need to cut right through. You just need to put a good scribe so you get a clean snap. Uh, I recommend you take the time to clamp it down because if you slip, right, with one of these, uh, I've never cut myself with an Ulfa in all my whole career. The only cuts I've had were like I smashed that against the maple last week, right? Like I was pulling a brad and it slipped and I hit, hit the kiss the corner of the ramp on the maple and it just split my finger probably worse than what a light cut of that would do. Um, and then I've driven a brad through my nail many years ago and just in cabinet building, but I've never actually cut myself with an Ulfa. And I have three or four of them and I used them full time in the film industry as a sculptor. I was, it's just a miracle that I never I cut thousands of board feet carved of foam, and I never once was cut by one of these babies. Isn't that amazing? But anyway, it'll get you somewhere else. 
if you do this long enough. So clamp your work down, especially the heavy stuff. The light stuff you don't have to, but when you're doing a heavy run, long run like this, I recommend you clamp it down. And then uh, that way you'll get a good clean straight line as well. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay, and it's nice and, f and square. That's the beauty of uh, scratch building evergreen plastic. Oh, and just let me say an evergreen plastic. Like some people say, oh, you can buy it in large sheets. You don't have to pay for evergreen. Yeah, that's true. I used to do that in the industry. If you have that kind of budget or you have the opportunity to do it. But not all plastic is the same. Uh, I've worked with it with many types of plastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I find that the evergreen scale models plastic is a bit softer than the industry uh, stuff. Uh, so if you can find the same kind of styrene plastic, then, then that's great. But it's not all the same. I got a huge roll of it uh, out in my shed uh, that I don't use for this kind of thing because it's really hard. It's, it's harder. Like I'll use it for other stuff maybe for backing on something or whatever. But anyway, that's why I use this. Okay, there you go, the th uh, two and a quarter girders or whatever. This one's in the center front, which you'll only see part way in, and then the left and the right side. Uh, just scribed and snapped, and then I'll just sand them up, just knock down the edges and the bevel with a board sander. Rough them up on both sides. I like to rough up my uh, plastic as well, just it helps it glue better. There's a bit of a sheen on there, but... Uh, Anyway, yeah, it uh, didn't take long. I goofed up on the first two, though, just to let you know. I cut the first two, like you may have noticed if you go back, I cut them on a point to a point here. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> so I had to recut two more. That's the way it is, because they're squared off here, and then I'm going to round these off with a compass, just a little bit each one, and then glue the flanges and the other detail. Uh, they're pretty minimalist, these, anyway. There's not a lot of... Uh, detail on here other than just the uh, the girders and the risers and the flanges and then the you know the name rail link on the side really and then of course the weathering but yeah, it'll be kind of cool okay so this is the flange material for the plates for the ramp girders and I'm using number 138 30 thou by 188 Okay, so here's a little tip. So I just glue, you know, like normal way in the jig here, push against, run a bead. Now I let that dry up to that corner. Now this is what I do to get a nice sharp corner here is I just push it tight into here and then just roll it as you bend it and push in, okay, like that, okay. Now don't put glue right in the corner right away, otherwise it will crack it. Just put a little bit there, and you can run it down here if you want. Once this area dries a bit, you can just drop in a little bit of cement there while it's pressed in so that way it won't fracture on the corner like it did on this one, see? See right there? It broke because I put cement in the corner too early. so. That's the trick to bending this stuff. It's really good. It'll bend um, really easy for you if you just, uh, you know, you, you're gentle with it, but firm, right? Okay. Okay, here's another one for you. Okay. Press it in on the corner. Put the pr pressure in like that. And then just turn it 
fold it up flat. Just relax it a bit to let the glue get down in there, capillary, and then push it tight. Be afraid to flood the corner a bit. That way you get a really nice weld. And keep a tool around like this to press down, make sure it's square. Just hold it for 10 or 15 seconds and she should be good. Okay. Okay, so this uh, ramp grid is pretty much done. There's a few other details like a hole drilled here for a pipe and cables. These are pretty simple and I think there's a little triangular uh, bracket that goes in here because there's a big beam underneath there which is actually part of the, uh, the concrete column like the hydraulic lifts. And then the three products I used here for the flanges is uh, number 103, 10 thou by 60 thou, which is this very thin one down the center. And then number 125, 20 thou by 100 for these upright verticals. And then 30 by 188 for the outer perimeter, basically uh, flange there. So, you know, there's the three different sizes and those are the sizes I chose to do because they're fairly distinct like if you look at the photo here you can see this main flange here the heavier one on the bottom and then this one that's a little bit lighter the vertical one going up and then there's this really light sort of rib that runs like it doesn't even go to the end like again you know an engineer would know uh, about that maybe it has to do with tension or expansion on the metal I'm, I'm just not really sure about that but um, I modeled it in there, so there it is. It's very thin and a very tricky piece to get straight. Uh, I didn't do it live because I didn't want to mess it up. My hands would have been in the way and it wouldn't have been made for a good video. But how I did it was is I just tacked this end first and let it dry. And I pulled this straight and then I basically laid in this straight edge, ran a light bead there and just touched it straight like that and then pulled it away and left it. And then I moved down to here, put a bead on the other side, just, you know, squeezed it a bit, just to make sure gently, quickly, and left it. And it was sort of a one-shot deal uh, without messing up the surface too much. Uh, the other one here, I haven't finished yet, but I did mess it up a little bit here. You can't really see it, but it, it didn't go as smoothly as the other, but I'll get it. But it's on the other side, so you won't see it. And that could just be a little bit of rust or corrosion there anyway, from rain and stuff, you know. You try to let your mistakes work, like work your mistakes, like work with them uh, during the paint phase, and everything will be okay. And then here's the centerpiece with some vertical flange work there. I'll just nibble and trim those off. And this slips into that maple slot, remember? So you'll see this sort of on an angle like that when you're looking at the front of the ramp with uh, you know one of these on each side. Okay. 